فاتحة بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله الحمد لله الذي أنزل الفرقان على عبده ليكون للعالمين نذيرا والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق ونور عرش أفضل الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيبنا وسيدنا وسندنا وشفيعنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المأسمين المظلومين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتاب المجيد وقوله الحق وهو أستق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم محمد رسول الله والذين معه شداء للكفار رحماء بينهم تراهم ركعا سجدا يبتغون فضل من الله ورضوان سيماهم في وجوه من أثر السجود ذلك مثل في التوراة ومثل في الإنجيل كزرع أخرج شطأه فأزره فاستغلظ فاستوى على سوقه يعجب الزرع ليغيظ بهم الكفار وعد الله الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات منهم مغفرة وأجرا عظيما صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل I begin in Allah's name the beneficent the merciful and all praise belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I send my condolences to the human race for the tragic events that took place in the year 61 after Hijrah 680 AD in October, wherein the epitome of good, meaning the representative of God, the Khalifatullah, was massacred simply because he represents the ultimate truth, the truth that the evil forces wants to obfuscate, the truth that wants to obliterate, the enemy wants to obliterate this truth and to mix it with falsehood so the human race can go astray as Iblis promised Allah when he failed, فَبِعِزَّتِكَ لَأُغْوِيَنَّهُمْ أَجْمَعِينَ إِلَّا عِبَادَكَ مِنْهُمُ الْمُخْلَصِينَ Iblis promised Allah that by your authority, I will beguile this human race that has caused my downfall. That has caused my downfall is parenthetical. لَأُغْوِيَنَّهُمْ أَجْمَعِينَ I will fool them. لَأُغْوِيَنَّهُمْ أَجْمَعِينَ Accept your purified servants. إِلَّا عِبَادَكَ مِنْهُمُ الْمُخْلَصِينَ So shaitan agrees that the agents of God who Allah chooses, he has no power over them. But nonetheless, he is there to cause harm, destruction, death. But he cannot affect the agents of God, even though a sword is put on them. For they are indomitable, as we say. رِجَالٌ لَتُلْهِهِمْ تِجَارَةٌ Mankind that do not bargain for any price for the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this happened, as you know, in a very momentous event. For in history, we have tragedies that took place, but nothing equals the tragedy of Karbala. Now people may say, look, more people have been massacred than in Karbala. In Karbala, the good ones were massacred a, few, a little over a hundred. And then, of course, they were enslaved. Some would argue that, well, some massacres were in the millions. You know, World War II, 60 million people died. You might say that sometimes a genocide, Saddam used to kill, you know, tens of thousands of people. So why is Karbala more important than that? Or why are they not equal? The reality is that when people get massacred, and those who massacre them are usually just after power, and they find these people marginal position. They want to abuse them. They want to exercise their authority. And therefore they kill them. But those who are killed have a mixture of good and not so good. They're innocent, but they get killed. But those who get killed on the innocent side are not the proponents of holding the flag and the banner of the ultimate truth. So what we notice that in society when massacres do take place is that while the evil forces do punish the good forces, 
the good are intrinsically in nature good. And they are good people in the sense that they're not harming others. But they're not the flag bearers of truth. Look at us as a community. We as a community anywhere in the world, holistically, the people are good. We may do some wrong. Some of our members indulge in drugs and in cheating and in lying. But holistically, as a community, we're good. All communities holistically are good. It's the law of nature. Allah says, Allah ahsana kulla shay'in khalaqa. Indeed, Allah created all good kind. For those to be really evil, they have to work hard. Fir'aun worked hard to maintain his hegemony over the people. He worked hard to ensure that nobody challenged him. He worked hard to eradicate any form of resistance. There are few like that. We have them at low levels within our own communities who exercise power, but not at the level of Fir'aun, of Muawiyah, Yazid. People like these are few, but they cause a lot of damage. The difference in Karbala was that the Umayyad Empire was a contemporary of the Prophet. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Salawat ala Muhammad wa And historically, you will notice that they were actually part of the Prophet's extended family. Umayyah himself actually had a um, friction with Hashim. As you know, Hashim is the grandfather of the Holy Prophet. Hence, they are known as Banu Hashim. They are a unique family chosen by Allah to represent mankind, to represent Allah to mankind. So the Banu Hashim are a chosen people. Allah says, Inna Allah astafa Adama wa Nuh. See? Wa al Ibrahim. We have chosen certain group of people to be superior to others as leaders of society. Because the law of nature that God has created intrinsically demands leadership. You will never find any society that produces fruitful results until and unless there's a sound leadership to represent it. The kind of leadership that exercises equity, balance, long-term vision, strength, fortitude as we say, an intrepid individual who refuses to bow to any false principles and is willing to die for that. Such principles bring out the most values for humanity. So you will notice that when Allah created mankind after this earth was incubated, where it could sustain life, then Allah says to his angels, And Allah declared to the angels, that I will place on earth my representative. Why representative? Because intelligent beings who are tested have a hierarchical structure by which to obey structure. For we find that success is when things are structured, when there is a hierarchy. We are Muslims. What is the shahadatain? La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. Why do we say that? It's hierarchy. We are bearing allegiance that nothing is superior to God and his messenger. They are our guidelines. The minute we bear witness to the shahadatain, we are bearing allegiance to our hierarchy, which means that should we go astray morally, we will hold each other to task and say, hey, you bore allegiance to the hierarchy. Like in the United States, you bear allegiance to the flag, but you bear allegiance to the constitution. For when push comes to shove and you end up in Supreme Court, it's usually constitutional law that's going to dictate whether you're within the parameters of the law or you're outside of the law. Structure. We have to have it. If we don't have it, it's chaos. You take the finest basketball players, all the best in the world today, LeBron, Curry, combine them all, and there's no coach, there's no leader. The likelihood of them winning a game is low. But they're all experts in their game. But the cohesive nature of taking the genius of an individual collectively and directing it in a fruitful fashion requires good leadership. I give a good example, another one. Let's look at Steve Jobs, who's gone from this world, who's passed away. 
His company now is richer than the United States government, worth over a trillion dollars. It's the first company that crosses the trillion dollar mark. This is insanity. That's a thousand billion dollars. It's insanity, the numbers. Apple is like that. But if you examine him as a leader, you will find that when he founded Apple, Apple was on a positive trajectory. He's a smart businessman, knew the psyche of the humans, and was playing with it to pull them. Of course, he was a crude businessman, ruthless in many ways, but nonetheless, a leader. Now, such leadership is not what Islam promotes, but just to give you an example of the necessity of leadership, even though it's crude. You find that a person like him, when he was fired by John Scully, Apple took a nosedive and was about to become bankrupt, was about to go bankrupt. Apple had lost its value because the leader was pushed aside. The vision was pushed aside. The force was pushed aside. People said, no, we can manage this company. And you notice Apple took a nosedive and they had no option but to bring him back. And when he came back, he took Apple to another dimension. Now let's argue for the moment and see. I don't want to go too far into this tangent, but I want to make a clear point on this. So when we talk about Ahlul Bayt, when we talk about Imamat, when we talk about Nubuwa, when we talk about prophethood, when we talk about leadership, and when we talk about the tragedy of Karbala, we will understand the gravity of why it's so important. That this commemoration is no ritual. It's not recycling religion. Some people say, Ashura comes, you, you don the black. What's the point? Why do we keep rehashing this event that happened 14 centuries ago? Why is it important for me today? Why do you shed so many tears? And why do you strike yourself, you know, to show your grief? What is your point? I don't understand. When you understand this, you will see the gravity of the satanic law that tries to remove the very essence of God's law through leadership by replacing the correct leadership with corrupt leadership. That's all it takes. It's like, if I want to defeat an army, replace the general with yours. And you got the army, they're dead. You can have a million man army. You replace one general who's at the head and he can cause chaos for the entire army to collapse. That's the power of one individual. Shaitan knows that and he's working on that. And you and I, our obligation is to recognize the divine leadership and to maintain it under no circumstance do we negotiate that matter. Not because we're closed-minded. Not because we are indoctrinated. No. We insist on its gravity. For if we were to replace it, it is tantamount to dismantling the entire system is like saying kill the captain and let's drill a hole in the ship you will sink now steve job dies but the vision is there the momentum is there now he's dead so you can't bring him back so everybody knows he's no longer sidelined and let's all just have his spirit and just remember him in apple and just try to imagine how good he must have been and what his thought process must have been and let's just take Apple to new heights without a CEO. No investor will look at you in the right way and say, you're crazy. You're out of your mind. But we got the spirit. The product is here. It's been here for decades. We understand it. This is the same analogy people use that we have Rasulullah. He came 1400 years ago. We don't need a living Imam. We don't need a living leader today. There's no need. We have a template. It's already there. Let's just follow that template. Notice how absurd it is that in our day-to-day -day operations, none of us can function on day-to-day -day function until and unless we at least recognize that there exists a leader. Most people who own an iPhone have never met the new CEO, Apple. We don't care. We know there's one out there managing. So when people say, why do you believe in Imam Sahib al-Zaman Allah Ta'ala Farajak, Salawat ala Muhammad wa al Muhammad. We say leadership. Ya ayu al amanu, Allah says in Surah Al-Nisa, verse 59, Ati'u Allah wa ati'u Rasul wa uli lamari minkum. All you who believe, obey Allah and obey their Prophet. 
and those with vested authority among you. amri minkum. It's present now. It's always present. Because Allah says, without leadership, without the presence of leadership, how do you human beings function? You cannot. Look at the corporate level, at the sports level. You always need a captain. You always need a coach. You always, one gets fired, next one gets replaced. You always ask, oh, this one got fired, who replaced him? What if the leader, the owner of the leader, of the team, they says, no, we, we don't need any more captains, no more coaches. You'd be scratching your heads. What? Impossible. No, they're all pros. These guys know how to throw a ball with their eyes closed. Muscle memory, they got it. No, you don't have it. That combination by which to traverse complicated matters on a daily basis requires hikmah, wisdom, connections. Human nature is precarious. One day we wake up from the wrong side of the bed and we're in a bad mood and now we're bashing everybody. On the other side, you've got a pleasant person forgiving everybody. And then you got this heated exchange that two people got off on the bed, wrong side of the bed and chaos is ensuing. You've got to stop it because if you don't, it can spread like a cancer. Who's there to lead it? Well, there's a hierarchy. This is why the shahada of Imam Hussein is so important. When Allah says, خلق السماوات والأرض بالحق We created the universe in truth and the essence of truth must be practiced through practical applications. So Allah says, إِنِّي جَاعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خليفة. We are the only school among the Abrahamic faiths that believes that Adam was not only the first human being but the first prophet of God. When people say Islam started 1400 years ago, correct them please and tell them, no, I beg to differ. Islam started for the human beings with Adam. Salawat ala Muhammad wa al Muhammad. When we talk about how Imam dealt, all our Imams, particularly Imam Hussein alayhi salam, let's pay attention that he's our leader. He continues to be our leader. Though he has become shaheed, Allah said, لا تقولوا لمن يقتل في سبيل الله أموات بل أحياء ولكن لا تشعرون don't say those who die in the way of God are dead. Nay, they are alive, but you cannot see them. He is our leader. How? On many fronts. First and foremost, understand that within our school of thought, the Ja'afari school of thought, we are the only school of thought among all religions in the world that insists that the divine leadership started with Adam and will continue as the last human being on this earth. And there will never be a time when the leader of God is not present on this earth. We're the only school, we're the only religion on earth. There are thousands of religion. We're the only one who insists on that. Now, if you dissect it, you will see that rationally and logically, this is an essential piece of the equation. If you and I are to submit to the purpose and vision of why God created us. Otherwise, we might as well become deistic for those who say God created us, but he is no longer involved in us and we are free to do what we want. And then one day he'll collect us and then he'll just decide to do something with us. No. We were created for a, for a purpose. رَبَّنَا مَا خَلَقْتَ هَذَا بَاطِلًا سُبْحَانَهُ فَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ My Lord, you did not create this in vain. There's a purpose in this world. And every second counts. For all it takes is one second. How many children have we lost and adults that we've lost to go astray and lose their faith only within a matter of a few seconds. For it took somebody to whisper an idea in our ears and it led us to try it. And the next thing we're gone astray and we're now indulgent in something wrong and we're addicted to it and we cannot get out of it. It takes only a few seconds. You might think, no, 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 it's a protracted problem. It takes a long time to go astray. Absolutely not. It takes a few seconds. So it's only prudent for us to believe that divine leadership and guidance and prudency at the level of constant God consciousness, not in a myopic way where we are close-minded extremists, but ones who are conscious that, no, you are suggesting something wrong to me. I'm being cautious. No. Say no to haram. Say no to indecency. Say no to suggestive ideas. For all it takes is one wrong move and you could be trapped in it for life. Even prophets. 
They achieved the highest standards in this world. They were tested upon tested upon tested. And they never failed. Yet even they used to pray. Yusuf says, Tawaffani Musliman wa'alhiqni bis-salihin. Yusuf achieved the highest status after trial upon trial upon trial. And he never left Allah. He never condemned Allah. He never became an atheist. He never doubted. He was not an agnostic. He struggled and struggled and struggled. Never questioned the integrity of the trial. He never questioned the wisdom and the mercy of God. For he's a prophet of God being taken into slavery away from his beloved father for decades. Enslaved, given extreme beauty to be trapped by a woman who's powerful and rich and who wants him to degrade his moral component. Even then, when the king of the time recognized his greatness and offered him the treasury of Egypt, he did not lose Allah. He did not become drunk with power. He did not say, oh, now I'm rich and powerful, so I don't need God anymore. Many of us, when we become rich and powerful, we say, what God? I don't need God. My mighty dollar saves me. And you see the arrogance when people become rich and powerful. They exercise it with impunity. Kill him. Destroy him. Just pick up the phone and backbite somebody and because I'm so great and I'm so rich and I'm so powerful. No one was more powerful at that time than Yusuf He says, Rabbi qad ataytani min al-mulk wa'allamtani min ta'wil al-hadith. فاطر السماوات والأرض أنت ولي في الدنيا والآخرة توفني مسلما والحقني بالصالحين I cry when I read this verse that my prophet is touching me and telling me do you understand I'm your leader I'm your leader we're all one 124,000 of us we're all one and the same our message is the same which one do you want take any one of us we're all the same but don't forget your living one but that's the one who will be your witness on judgment day. As Allah said, On that day, everybody will be raised with their imam, with their leader. Who did you follow as your leader? Was it Donald Trump? Hmm? Did you follow such a leader? So the question is, where do you follow? And Allah will raise us like birds with the same feathers who flock together. That we pray to God that when He raises us, He raises us among the finest. The foremost of the foremost. They will enter paradise and they will remain in it without any questions. That's the group you and I want to be with. This commemoration is the reflection of how to be in that group. See, Zuhair ibn Qayn, Imam salam meets him on his way to Kufa. And Zuhair was not a follower of Ahl al-Bayt. He was actually an Uthmani. He believed Uthman was the caliph. He was fooled in leadership. So he meets Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And they meet in a tent. No one knows what transpired. The only thing we know was Zuhair was a wealthy man. He had his spouses there. His children were there. He meets the Imam in the tent. And Imam tells him his mission. And Zuhair is so touched by that mission. He understands why he exists. He knew what he needed to do to seal his destiny to be among the Sabiqun as Sabiqun. He had to make a choice. So he comes out of the tent and he tells his family, I free all of you, go. I am going to go with Hussein ibn Ali. And I know that our destiny is that we will be massacred. But I am ready to do that for this great purpose that I'm going to go for sacrificially for my love of God is so supreme that it is an eternal movement and I would be foolish to bargain anything else. How many of us can be like that? How many of us, we should ask ourselves, were the imam to meet us on a pathway where we were busy planning our homes and our vacations and our futures and how much wealth we were going to invest all over the world, including offshore. And suddenly somebody meets you and says, hey, there's a purpose in life. And you look at him in the eye and you know this is the agent of God 
who's pulling you, telling you, come with me, you have a choice. You can go there or you can go here. Which one do you want? He says, no, no, I want this one. Join me. It's a choice. Allah says, inna hadaynahu sabila, inma shakiran wa inma kafura. We guided you to the path, whether you're grateful or ungrateful. Which path do you want? So leadership. Tonight, we talk about Imam Hussein alayhi salam, his blessed family. We talk about his cousin, Muslim ibn Aqil. Tonight, actually last night, technically was the first night of Muharram. As you know, soon after when the Imam was invited, he was told, come to Kufa. Muawiyah has just died. We are with you. Many, many of the people of Kufa wrote thousands of letters to the Imam inviting him to come. For they said it is time to establish the real leadership that God conferred upon your father. You know, Allah says, Ya yuhar Rasul, Ballig ma unzila ilayka min rabbik, wa in lam taf'al, fa ma ballagta risalata. Wallahu ya'asimuka min an nas. O Messenger of God, deliver what has been commanded of you to deliver. Ballig ma unzila ilayka min rabbik. What your Lord has revealed to you. And if you don't do it, then you have not delivered the message of God. This came in the last year of the Prophet's life. When Salah was established, fasting was established, Hajj was established, the rules of Islam were established. It was complete. Complete. Notice the gravity of leadership. That not only does the religion of God hinge that the entire religion begin with leadership, but it also ends with leadership. That's how important leadership is. Look at the chaos in our societies and the apathy in religion within our societies and see where the problem really lies. You will notice from the top down is a leadership problem. And the conclusion of such leadership is flawed. But we have leaders who are selling themselves for cheap, leading societies to go astray. And therefore we are losing Iman and our children are not even praying. Our sisters are questioning the integrity of hijab. We'll talk about that. The battle of decency. For our children don't even know what is decency. They think this headscarf is a burden. They think being modest is a burden. When you tell our brothers, don't chase girls. Oh, it's a burden. Don't date freely. It's a burden. Where is my freedom? Where is my happiness? Why can't I indulge in it? Today our children are addicted to smartphones where depression has risen so much that 30% rise in the United States since 2012 in suicide. You don't need to be killed anymore. We're killing ourselves. That level of depression comes when there's no zikr of Allah, when there's no tadabbur, when there's no tafakkur, when there's no tadhakkur, when there's no pondering, thinking, reflecting. We're just voracious creatures running towards the flashing lights. For what is my friend thinking? Fortnite, our children play Fortnite. They're addicted to Fortnite. Now it may be a good game, but I'll tell you what's really driving it. All my friends are playing it. I ask, it's wajib. Astaghfirullah. You cannot play it. Mom, it's haram if I don't play it. A'udhu billah. You're denying me my freedom. My power to destroy. My power to waste my brain. My power to become a couch potato. And then you're 60 years of age. You know an ayah of Quran? No. What happened? I've been busy killing in cyber world. Gaming. They turn the lights off. They turn on the blue light. And they're so good. Even their computers are lit. Oh yeah, the keyboards have to be lit. Then they live in this cyber world. Ooh. Then of course you got virtual reality. What's even better? Thank you. What's even better is augmented reality. Ooh. Now I don't even have to leave my house. <laughs> I can transpose myself into somebody else. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. One more salawat. Why do we have this problem? Parents come to me, Hajj, please. 
for you. You know, research shows anything over two hours of use of this smartphone leads to depression. Antisocial. They don't know how to say even salam alaikum. They don't even know how to give you eye contact. They don't even know how to shake hands. Yeah, we're becoming zombies. So the system is, we now need to take this cell phone and smash it, burn it, melt it, put acid in it. Really? That's not where the problem is. There are plenty of knives in the kitchen. Plenty. That's not where the problem is. It's you and I lacking understanding. We're depressed. We want to get depressed. We're looking for something. We're looking for some kind of an excitement. And shaitan says, oh, come, come, come. <laughs> I promise God I'm going to do this to you. Come on, come on. And they say, you know, shaitan says on judgment day, I just looked at you and you ran towards me. Don't blame me. Blame yourselves. I just suggested you followed me. Now, children, what wrong did children do to get into that? You know why children go there? They're innocent. When children get into these, you know, elusive games that destroys them from the inner, you can't really blame them. They're not evil. Parents are not evil. But there's a disconnection. We haven't valued what God has warned us about. And Allah is warning us. Oh God, stop, please. You keep telling me this. Ah, religion. I don't want religion. Salah. Don't, like, religion just causes wars and killing. This is what you hear. Religion, oh. Let me define religion. Religion is a way of life. Nobody is not religious. Everybody has a religion. Everybody has a deen. But there is the true religion where you are disciplined, where you know how to press the right buttons and bring the right results, or you will be pressing the wrong buttons. The mere fact of not pressing any buttons is also a wrong religion. So when you say I'm religious, what do you mean by that? Oh, you talk about God. I said, have you, how much do you know God? I met an atheist who says, I don't believe in God. I said, why? She said, I haven't seen him. I said, true. There are many things you and I haven't seen. But how did you conclude he's not there? Maybe he's there. He just looked at me and says, well, I haven't thought about that. I said, wow, that was quick. So you... Just jump to this conclusion? You didn't ponder? See, that's the danger. My friend told me there is no God. God doesn't work. I prayed. It wasn't answered. We have a transaction with God, you see. We go do business with God. I'll pray to you, God, but you got to give me something. And if you don't give me something, <laughs> I don't need you anymore. Thank you very much. I don't like you anymore. People are like that. We're transactional, ignorant, jahil, foolish. When prayer is not meant for that, prayer is, a, is meant for gratitude. It's meant for recognition. It's meant to be a discipline. Inna salata tanha anil fahshai wal munkar. Wala dhikrullahi akbar. It's good. It's the best thing you will do. But we don't articulate it properly. So we see it as a burden. And then we compare it to our non-Muslim friends who seem to be just as good and having such a good time. But they don't pray. So why should I pray? Those of us who pray, those of us who believe in God, those of us who believe in Allah, in the Quran as Muslims, I'm telling you this with no compunction, as we'd say. I have no reservations. We are selected elite who have been granted special knowledge in society. We're like born in a family of scientists. We have access to the secrets of life that the average population doesn't have. And we are bashing science. Whereas we need to indulge in what we've been blessed so that we lead societies. Allah says, Huwa jtabakum, wa ma ja'ala alaykum fi ddini min haraj, millata abikum Ibrahim, huwa sammakul muslimin min qabl, wa fi hadha. Why? 
So the prophet is a witness over you. And you are a witness over the people. وَتَكُونُ شُهَدَ عَلَى النَّاسِ Allah says, I've chosen you. We're bashing deen. We're bashing modesty. We're bashing religion. The net result, our children are falling into crevices and we're becoming part of the normal statistics where suicide rates are increasing, drug abuse is increasing, apathy is increasing, family feuds are increasing, divorces are increasing, all kinds of problems. Is it because it's the law of nature? No. It's the law of nature if you and I ignore our responsibilities. It's like you don't brush your teeth every day. You will have problems with your teeth. Because the law of nature stipulates if you don't maintain cleanliness, if you don't maintain a hygienic lifestyle, then there will be pathogens that will cause you to become sicker. Same with deen. If deen is not maintained, then you become sick. How do we understand all these pathogens? leaders knowing the value so our children are going astray our families are going astray because we've taken religion as a lip service our leaders are just a lip service we cry for Imam Hussein as a lip service do we ever ponder to say that I want me and my children to grow up in the footsteps of Hussein Ibn Ali to, 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 to follow in the footsteps of Zainab salam, to follow the footsteps of Fatima Zahra alayha. do we think this way no, that happened 1400 years ago. It's old history. We are modern today, you see. We need to be with the times. And our imams were archaic. Our imams are not archaic. They're not. The principle of goodness never changes forever. A million years ago to a million years from today, it never changes. That trajectory continues to flow. So leadership. Who is, what kind of leadership? You and I, every one of us in this room has a role model. I can sit with atheists and they will quote who they look up to. They will quote their leaders. You go to Christians, they will quote their leaders. You go to Jews, they will quote their leaders. You go to atheists, agnostics, they will quote their leaders. None of us can escape a role model that affects us somehow that we look up to as our point of goal. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I advise us all that while we have these minuscule leaders, if they do not align with the master leader of Allah and the Prophet and his Ahlul Bayt, then you and I are most likely being taken astray. It's just the law of God. So this commemoration is not to recycle religion. It is to understand the gravity of this leadership. That inshallah after these 10 nights, when we reach the ultimate 10th night of Muharram, when Imam Hussein alayhi salam bids farewell to his family, bids farewell to Imam Zain al Abidin, you and I have that image of this Imam who's choosing to go forward. He has an option of bowing to Yazid. He has an option of giving it all up and being free and living comfortably in this transient world. He has an option. But he says, never. So Allah says, رِجَالٌ لَا تُلْهِيهِمْ تِجَارَةٌ وَلَا بَيْعٌ عَنْ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ وَإِقَامِ الصَّلَاةِ وَإِتَاعِ الزَّكَاةِ يَخَافُونَ يَوْمًا تَتَقَلَّبُ فِيهِ الْقُلُوبُ وَالْأَبْصَارِ Mankind that does not bargain, they maintain their prayers, they maintain their charity, they maintain their dignity, Allah says. And they are afraid of that day when God will hold them liable. For God says, I have chosen you so much. I have gifted you with so much. What have you done with it? Did you use it properly? I think that positive fear is how you and I should live. That we are too chosen. We are too gifted. We are too blessed. When Allah says to me, You know what that means? Hmm? Allah says, وَجَاهِدُ فِي اللَّهِ حَقَّ جِهَادِ Suratul Hajj, verse number 78. وَجَاهِدُ فِي اللَّهِ حَقَّ جِهَادِ Struggle in the way of your Lord, the way He deserves it. How much do you deserve, Ya Allah? How much sacrifice should I give for you? When we say, قُلْ إِنَّ صَلَاتِي وَنُسُكِي وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَمَاتِي لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ My prayer, my sacrifice, my life, my death. All of it, Ya Allah, for you. Allah says the whole gamut. He says, yes, إِنَّ اللَّهَ اشْتَرَى 
God has purchased from some believers their souls. Purchased. How do you purchase when you own it? Allah says they have sold it to me from the perspective that they do nothing but for me. Allah says, I chose them. Watch tabakum. And we didn't make religion difficult. Imam Hussain alayhi salam says, I'm your leader. This commemoration is where power comes from. It's where justice is going to come. Today, the message of Karbala is the most powerful media instrument on earth. Nobody in history has been able to maintain the consistency and the growth of the message of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, where now it has penetrated mass media on all the main stations and they're talking about Karbala and they're talking about Imam Hussein, where hundreds of millions of people are talking about it. And the media of Imam Hussein alayhi salam continues to grow at the core level of where shaitan is actually working to destroy mankind. Through superpower hegemony entering our Muslim lands to kill us, to destroy us, to remove our deen. They tried it with the Ottomans and they went to the Turks and told them this Quran is in Arabic. Get rid of the Arabic. This is how the enemy works. The enemy comes and takes our culture from us, takes our lingo from us, takes our name from us. You know, they used to call us Muhammadans. We Muslims in history never called ourselves Muhammadans, but they called us Muhammadans. Why? Because they're working hard to strip us of the gift of God. When God says, I've chosen you. And I want, they said, they read Arabic. When Allah says, Inna anzalnahu Quranan Arabiyan la'allakum ta'qilun. Indeed, we reveal this Quran in Arabic so you know, and it's deep and it's powerful. And it is so amazing that nobody has messed with it for 14 centuries. All five madahib, all five schools of thought unanimously agree that this is kalamullah. This is the word of God. And the enemy tries to adulterate it. Take one fatha out, take one kasra out, take one letter out so that we can fool them the way we've been fooled. And it's not happening. It's not happening. Allah promises. It is our desire to make you the oppressed, the inheritors. This is even in the Bibles. The meek shall inherit the earth. How? Leadership. You and I would not have any understanding of this conversation. I see myself as a Muslim today when I ponder and I reflect and I read the Quran and I remember the Hadith and I remember the Ahlul Bayt and there's a guidance and I reflect on it. I said, what sacrifice did you make, O prophets, O imams? What sacrifices did you make that I am such a beneficiary 14 centuries later, that I have meaning to my life, that I can avoid these distractions, that I can avoid going into depression so that I can indulge in the hope of God and I can fulfill what God has created before when he says that I have chosen you. What a blessing. The Imam says we had to give our necks. We had to give our families. We had to spill our blood. And we were taken as slaves city to city to keep your faith alive. How important is that message? Tell me. Humans will try to keep their messages alive when their families are massacred. But it dies in time. This one continues to grow. This one has become the source of power for resistance in today's Middle East, where the enemy is invading lands. And the ones who have the love of Hussein ibn Ali alayhi salam understand the value and they rise with antiquated armaments, whereas the other side has the most sophisticated weapons and they cannot penetrate because the Iman is stronger than anything in the universe. Salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. Imam Hussain alayhi salam, tonight within the short time, my time is up, I'd like to reflect on his wasiyya. He leaves a wasiyya to his brother Muhammad ibn Hanafiya. I'm going to introduce it tonight briefly, briefly talk about Muslim ibn Aqil within a few minutes. The sacrifice of Muslim ibn Aqil, who's called, as you know, to Kufa, people join him, they support him, and they're all excited that he's coming. But then one Ibn Ziyad, single man, rides in his, with his horse, covered with his face. You know, covered 
on his face. He enters, and people think it's Imam Hussein. One man, a coward, a coward. The Muslim in Aqil is praying. By the time he's done with Salah, he looks behind and everybody's gone. I ask us, you and I, how many of us will run away when Muslim Ibn Aqil comes? How many of us will run away when Imam Sahib Zaman alayhi salam come? But we give lip service to deen. But it takes guts to stand up and fight. It takes guts to be firm. Imam is leaving this message. He says, Anna al Hussein. He writes this letter to his brother. Yashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika la. Wa anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh. Jaa bil haqqi min indihi. Wa anna al jannata haqq. Wa al nara haqq. Wa al sa'ata aataytahu la rayba fiha. Wa anna allaha yab'athu man fi al qubur. Look how Imam is starting his will. He's leaving Medina to go to Mecca. And he knows he's never coming back. He bids goodbye to his family. He leaves, he leaves Muhammad ibn Hanafiya, his stepbrother. He leaves him behind. And says, this is the will I'm leaving for you. For mankind to know, why am I going on this revolution? Because he will be accused that he wants power, that he wants authority. He's hungry. None of the above. And Allah says in the Quran, Kuntum khayra ummatin. You're the best in the ummah. You promote good, you forbid evil, you believe in God. Imam says, that's why I'm here. I'm your leader for that. He says, look at the, I'll translate this. He says, by the way, when the Imam starts, he establishes usul. He says, وَأَنَّ Hussein. He says, I bear witness there is no God but Allah. And that the Prophet is his messenger. Usul. You and I, anything you and I do in business, in transactions, when we have children, when we get married, say, Ya Allah, I bear witness you are my God. And I bear witness, Muhammad, you are my messenger. And I am held liable by your guidance. And now I want to get married. I want to have children. And I want generations to be soldiers for you. But my foundation is because of you. Imam is leaving wasiyah when Allah says tawasaw bil haq wa tawasaw bis sabr. Imam is bearing allegiance. He says wa anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasul jaa bil haq min indihi wa anna al jannata haq wa an nar haq. Paradise is true. Hell is true. The day of judgment is true. And I have no doubt in it. And that we will certainly come back alive. We will be raised from our graves when we die. He leaves this, he says. He says, وَأَنِّي لَمْ أَخْرُجْ أَشِرًا وَلَا بَثِرًا وَلَا مُفْسِدًا وَلَا ظَالِمًا وَإِنَّمَا خَرَجْتُ لِطَلَبِ الْإِصْلَاحِ فِي أُمَّةِ جَدِّي صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ Uridu, Uridu, and Amaru, Bil Maruf, Wanha, and Il Munkar, Wasiru, Bisirati Jeddi, Wabi Ali ibn Abi Talib, Woman Kabilani, Likabulin, Likabulil Hak, Wallahu Aula Bil Hak, Woman Radda Ali Hada, Asbiru Hatta, Yak the Allahu, Baini. Translation, Imam Hussain alayhi salam says, This movement of mine is not because of stubbornness, rebellion, worldly passions, or instigation by shaitan. It is also not my object to create trouble or to oppress anyone. The only thing which invites me to this great movement is that I should reform the affairs of the followers of my grandfather, eradicate corruption, undertake enjoining to do good and restraining from evil, and follow the tradition of my grandfather, the Prophet of Allah, and my father, Ali. He says, I've come out to reform the followers of my grandfather. 
if the people respond to my call and accept the truth from me, well and good. And if they don't accept it, I shall observe patience and I'm not afraid of unpleasant events. Subhanallah. Look at the firm resolution. You accept it, no problem. If you don't accept it, I don't negotiate. It's okay. He leaves me this was here. He leaves you and me. This was here. How important is Hussein ibn Ali? Muslim ibn Aqil is there. As you know, he had two sons. And after he was killed, his two sons wandered, being chased because Ibn Ziyad wanted to kill them. They're little boys. And both were killed. And their heads were thrown in the river. Muslim knew this would happen. He didn't care. The Aqil family were the cousins of Imam Hussain alayhi salam, gave the most lives in Karbala. They were not afraid. So Muslim, as you know, came to invite, to prepare the people for the Imam. And the Imam was leaving Mecca to go towards Kufa because he was invited. Farazdaq meets him on the way as he's leaving Mecca. He says, the people's tongues are towards you and their swords are towards your neck. Imam says, I know. He says, then why are you going? He says, I'm going to my destiny. I'm going to establish something. And you know, when you have an infant with you and you're traveling this long distance in the desert and premonition gives you that this child will become shaheed. Your women will be taken as slaves. They will be dragged city to city. How many of us can leave our comfort zones? How many? I end with this. That Muslim Ibn Aqil hears that Ibn Ziyad has entered. Ibn Ziyad comes to Kufa. Actually, he was the governor of Basra. Ibn Ziyad known as Ibn Marjana, Ubaidullah Ibn Ziyad was a tyrant. He was a horrible human being of his time. He was known as the butcher of Arabia. And Muawiyah liked him. They were related due to their illicit mothers, evil mothers. The roots were ugly. Ibn Ziyad was already the governor of Basra. Historically in Islam, there was never a governor who governed two cities. But Sir Jun, who was a Byzantium Christian, who was an advisor to Muawiyah, suggested that Kufa is the seat of Ali ibn Abi Talib, the seat of the Shia of Ali. If there is one city that will rise against you, it is Kufa. The Shia of Ali will rise against you. When they do, send Ibn Ziyad to crush them. So Ibn Ziyad is sent and he enters Kufa. Alone, brothers and sisters, alone with a small group of people. Alone in the sense, small band of people. The community could have in a heartbeat jumped on him, arrested him, imprisoned him. But rather, they were paralyzed. So Muslim is leading Salah. Hani ibn Arwa is behind him. Habib ibn Madahir is behind him. Yet he's leading prayers. Big crowd. They're all bearing allegiance to Imam Hussein. And they hear rumors, Ibn Ziyad is here. And he has put a bounty that whoever supports Muslim Ibn Aqil, their whole family will be butchered. So run. Ima, Muslim Ibn Aqil is finishing Salah in prayer. He looks behind, he notices a handful of people behind him. They all left him. He is now alone. So he's wandering the city of Kufa. Nobody wants to open the door. Yesterday, they welcomed him with the red carpet. Today, nobody cares for him. This is the world we live in today. The world where Allah says, put trust in me. Allah, Not the human being. These humans will call you. They will turn their faces in a heartbeat. And Muslim is wandering house to house to house. Finally, a woman invites him. He's sitting by the, her door and says, why are you here? She says, I am thirsty. She says, come inside. She was a good woman. She gives him water. But her husband was an evil man. When he comes home, Muslim was hiding. And he tells his wife that I am looking for Muslim. There's a bounty on Muslim's head. 
and I want that bounty. She was silent, but Muslim was moving in the room and his hiding spot was discovered. And therefore, Muslim runs. And now he begins to fight. From early morning till evening, Muslim is fighting. Alone, one man. He cornered himself in a narrow street and the enemy was attacking him from one side and they couldn't touch him. And they saved the enemies. They said, we will fight these agents of God and they will kill all of us one by one. Because Allah says, my soldiers are so powerful. When they believe in me, single-handedly they'll fight you. Today we see the happening. The spirit of our people who are resisting the enemies. They're making the enemies with the most powerful weapons collapse. Because they're touching the spirit of Muslim ibn Aqil. They're touching the spirit of Hussein ibn Aqil. Finally, they dig a moat. And they said, we will drop him in there. For that's the only way to stop him. And Muslim finally is subdued and he falls into the moat. And in the process, they pelted him with stones till his tooth broke and he was bleeding. And then he was arrested, brought into the palace of the governor. And Ibn Ziyad was pontificating on the throne. And he looks at him and he passes the judgment that he should be beheaded and thrown off the tall building. I saw that in Syria recently. When the enemies were killing, they were beheading and throwing bodies off the tall buildings. And I remember, see Allah, they did that to Muslim. It hasn't stopped 1400 years later. But before Muslim was slaughtered, Ibn Ziyad says, you have a last will? He said, yes, I have a small debt. Help me pay it off. Look at this. When he returns the amana, he says, I have a debt. I want to pay that debt. One, he says, send this letter to my brother Hussein ibn Ali, my cousin, and warn him not to come to Kufa, for danger lies here. Ibn Ziyad was stunned. He said, you don't have a wish for yourself, for your family, for your own safety. You don't want to beg from me. He says, we don't beg. But my master Hussein, his life, I will give a thousand times my life to save his life. So warn him, please, that he doesn't come to Kufa, for there looms danger for him. That's the concern he had. And as you know, Muslim ibn Aqil was beheaded, and his head was put on a spear at the gates of Kufa. Recite with me, please. وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليكم مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعل الله آخر الأحد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين خصوصا سيدي ومولاي أبا الفضل العباس وأختك زينب وبنتك رقية جميع شهداء كربلاء ورحمة الله وبركاته ألا لعنة الله على القوم الظالمين وسيعلم الذين ظلموه أي منقلب ينقلبون السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته We have a short نطميات Two minutes. You have a few minutes and then inshallah we will conclude. May Allah reward you. Azam Allah ujurana ujurakum inshallah. We have refreshments also after this.